Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Ryan Fitzpatrick and I'm the deputy or the director of the Climate and Energy Program at Third Ways uh, Climate and Energy Program, which focuses on uh, working to reduce emissions and finding the fastest and fairest path to getting to net zero emissions by 2050. Um, I am joining you from Provincetown, Massachusetts, which is all the way at the tip of Cape Cod, hence the seashell decor. Um, I wanna thank, thank all of you for zooming in for this briefing from wherever you are. Um, you know, over the next hour, we're gonna take a closer look at how clean energy businesses are faring in the current economic climate. And we're also excited to give this audience a sneak preview of uh, some results of a survey that Third Way put out to clean energy businesses. Uh, that's gonna be released later this week, but we wanted to give you all a, a chance to take a look first, and we can't wait to get your comments. We can't begin this conversation without taking a minute to recognize the tragedy that COVID-19 is inflicting on the US. It can't be overstated. Uh, with nearly 170,000 lives lost and, and millions more at risk, uh, this pandemic has devastated families, it's devastated entire communities, uh, and it's also devastated industries. So we know uh, that the pandemic is doing grave damage to the US economy which contracted by 32% um, in the second quarter. Uh, and that impact would have been far worse if the government hadn't stepped in quickly with massive fiscal and monetary stimulus policy. Many businesses still were forced to lay off workers or shutter completely with restaurants and other retailers being the hardest hit. Um, we know that clean energy businesses uh, are, are struggling too, uh, and that's bad news for a number of reasons. The clean energy, energy industry is uniquely critical to a number of national priorities, from climate change to global security to economic competitiveness. So it's very important that we maintain a strong and growing industry. But we don't have quite as much detail on the specific ways in which this industry is being impacted. We wanna know things like how severe has the damage been? What steps are these businesses taking or, or have they already taken to stay afloat? Um, uh, how are they keeping their doors open and making payroll? Has government assistance helped? And is it enough to keep their heads above water for much longer? Um, where do they see their revenues and employment levels heading over the next several months? And what are they doing to prepare? These are the types of questions that we want to explore today. Um, there are a lot of them, so we should probably get started. First off, my third way colleague, John Milko, is going to walk us through some eye-opening results from that survey that I mentioned, where we uh, put out a, a poll to clean energy businesses. And I think that's gonna shed a lot of light on the current situation. And then we're going to hear from a panel of experts on macro trends in the US economy and what they mean for clean energy businesses, the role of policy in putting this industry on a successful path forward. Um, you'll have a chance to join in uh, this conversation by chiming in on any and all of those topics uh, with your thoughts and questions for the panelists at the end of the hour. So with that, I am gonna turn it over to John Milko, Policy Advisor for Third Ways Climate and Energy Program. Thank you, Ryan, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I'll provide a brief overview of our survey's findings to leave as much time as I can for our panel. Uh, so the idea for this project, uh, if you just wanna do the uh, second slide. So the idea for this project started earlier this spring when we wanted to know how clean energy businesses and workers were coping with the economic downturn caused by COVID. There's an annual report of clean energy employment, but that doesn't provide the up-to-date information policymakers need to craft targeted legislation. So we developed a survey, an expansive list of clean energy businesses to discover the effects of COVID and learn how the government can provide adequate economic support. Slide. What did we find? Half our respondents took advantage of the Paycheck Protection Program, or PPP. Nearly half, 
will have to take actions adversely impacting workers after their financial assistance runs out. And two thirds of businesses have experienced order disruptions and could use further assistance in weathering this economic storm. Slide. One key feature of our survey is that it covers a broad swath of clean energy companies, as you can see here. We have seen sector specific reports, but none that cover the wide spectrum of businesses in the clean energy industry. And many respondents uh, are even active in multiple sectors. Slide. One thing most have in common, however, is their precar uh, precarious financial situation. 80% said COVID caused moderate to large negative impact on their business. Slide. And as I mentioned, 50% of respondents received PPP funding. If you exclude respondents that were too large to qualify for it in terms of number of employees, that number increases to 55%, which is much larger than the 17% average of all small businesses that receive PPP funding. Slide. A plurality of re, uh, respondents expect to take measures adversely affecting workers, including layoffs or furloughs, reduced hours, reduced wages, or even shuttering their business. 46% of respondents said they would need to exhaust one or more of these four options. Slide. Uh, ripples up and down the supply chain have caused delayed, reduced, or canceled orders for many businesses, as you can see in the chart to your left. Over 60% are experiencing delays, as shown in that green bar, 40% reductions in the dark blue, and 25% cancellations in the orange. On the right, you can see that 40% of respondents expect revenue to decrease over the next three months. Slide. So given this negative outlook, we asked respondents to select three policy mechanisms that would most help their businesses. Perhaps as no surprise, tax credits were the most popular. Converting tax credits to cash grants was the second most popular, and that would help small companies, developers, uh, realize tax benefits more quickly and efficient, uh, efficiently. Public infrastructure investment was third, followed by low interest loans, and then customer purchase subsidies, which for instance, uh, could include such measures as tax rebates for residential solar installation or electric vehicle purchases. Next slide. We also asked an open-ended question about broader climate and energy policy. And I don't know about everyone here, but um, these are the questions I typically skip on surveys. So that's what makes it so exciting that we had 170 business leaders take the time to provide their thoughts. And of these responses, 90% uh, voice support for positive and proactive legislation addressing climate change and supporting clean energy technologies. Next slide. So here are a few examples. Um, they included recommendations for the short term, but also broader recommendations for addressing climate change that they, I would say that these were fairly representative of the positive responses we received. The third one um, stuck out to us in particular as it aligns with recent third way polling, finding that many voters favor addressing climate change as a way to create jobs at home and improve American competitiveness globally. So I hope this was informative um, and I will kick it back to Ryan who will dive into these issues more deeply with our great panel. Thanks. I appreciate it. Um, so um, Yes, we will be releasing a full memo uh, on these polling results this week, and we'll email a link to that to everybody who registered for this event, in case you'd like to take a closer look. Uh, I want to thank John and Ellen Hughes-Cromwick and Andres Prieto 
um, from the Third Way team who helped pull this research together. Also, major thanks to Rick Clayton and Rick Rosen. Um, they are two statisticians with many, many years of experience at the US Department of Labor who provided a significant amount of guidance to us in designing the survey and interpreting the results. So thank you, Rick and Rick. Um, we do plan to conduct another round of this survey later in the fall to see if the conditions that are impacting clean energy businesses have changed and whether their needs for policy support have evolved. So stay tuned for that. As John said, we're gonna to move to our panel right now. Um, and I'm very excited to welcome uh, uh, three experts. We have Julia Coronado. Julia is the president and founder of Macro Policy Perspectives, which is an economic research firm. Julia has held senior ec economist positions uh, at some of the world's largest financial institutions. And she has extensive background in working with the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. We also have Ellen Hughes Cromwick, who uh, I am honored to work with at Third Way. She is a senior resident fellow here. And um, Ellen formerly served as chief economist at uh, the United States Department of Commerce and as chief global economist for Ford Motor Company. And we also have Lynn Abr Abramson, uh, who's the president and uh, uh, the president of the Clean Energy Business Network, uh, which provides policy and technical support to several thousand small and medium sized clean energy businesses. And Lynn, actually, I'd like to um, have you kick things off for us. And if you could briefly walk, walk us through some of your insights on how clean energy companies are faring based on the extensive engagement that, that CEBN does with business leaders. Yes, thank you so much, Ryan. And uh, thank you, John, for that really informative presentation and uh, really appreciate you're including CEBN's input on the uh, discussion and for inviting me to participate today. So next slide, please. The Clean Energy Business Network serves as the small business voice for the clean energy economy. And we work to enhance opportunities for clean energy technology and service providers through policy support, market and technology education and business development assistance. We're a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. Next slide, please. Our membership spans more than 4,400 clean energy business leaders across all 50 US states, primarily from small and mid-sized companies. And these businesses work across a very diverse range of zero and low carbon technologies representing the breadth of the clean energy industry. Slide. So to set the stage, I wanted to start by sharing some high level findings of the 2020 Sustainable Energy in America Factbook which is produced by Bloomberg New Energy Finance and the Business Council for Sustainable Energy, which is uh, our parent organization. These data illustrate the transformation of the US energy economy over the past decade. Prior to COVID-19, clean energy industries represented the growth sectors of the US energy economy. In 2010, as you can see on the left side of a uh, pie chart, nearly half of our nation's electricity came from coal. Today, that's down to about a quarter, replaced by zero and low carbon technologies such as renewable energy and natural gas. More than 3.2 million Americans worked in clean energy at the start of this year, more than any other energy sector. And wind and solar accounted for the fastest growing occupations in America. And as you can see by these graphics in the bottom of the screen, we've seen significant growth in renewable energy, natural gas, and energy efficiency over the past decade. And these changes are not coming at greater cost. In fact, total monthly household expenditures on energy are down one third since 2010. Next slide, please. So the policy needs expressed by participants in the third way survey align very closely with a lot of the historic priorities we have heard from our members. Over the past few years, we've done num numerous surveys and interviews with our members to understand the landscape of challenges facing clean energy businesses. And here are just a few of the key themes that have emerged, which include the lack of customer education or fear or inertia in adopting new technologies, difficulty accessing project finance to upgrade antiquated infrastructure, the valley of death to commercializing new technologies, regulatory or utility barriers to deployment, which is particularly relevant to on-site or distributed generation, and an overall environment of policy uncertainty with a lack of coordinated national climate and energy goals. 
So what I see in the survey results is that we're starting with a baseline of small businesses that are in a growing but still very highly challenging industry facing significant technological, regulatory, and financial stressors. And then on top of that, we're layering a global pandemic and economic shutdown, which just exacerbates the existing challenges while in introducing new ones. And I think some of the priorities that you heard expressed in this survey are reflective of those needs. Next slide. So uh, for better, for worse, I think, you know, even though um, we are seeing significant challenges right now, in a way, COVID-19 has actually hastened the decline of older, less profitable, and higher emitting industries and the transition to low carbon energy. And a lot of that's pure, being driven purely by economics. So I do think the, the promising thing for the clean energy industry is that on the other side of this crisis, clean energy really does represent the potential to rebuild a stronger, healthier, more resilient future for our nation, along with rebuilding the economy. So I'm not gonna go into all this in depth, but just a snapshot of some opportunities for Congress to assist the clean energy industry. Um, I do anticipate some additional rounds of COVID-19 relief this fall, but at this time, it seems like that will likely focus on stopgap assistance like the PPP and unemployment. Um, I am hopeful that there will be an opportunity to finalize the appropriations and defense authorization bills, which include some good measures for clean energy as those measures are pretty far along in development. And uh, there are a lot of other pending infrastructure bills relating to transportation, energy, innovation, and tax incentives. Many of those are quite far along in the process and are ready for floor action. It's possible we will see a window of opportunity for some of those these, this fall, but I suspect a lot of those issues might bleed into the next Congress and it really depends on the outcome of the elections. Um, I don't, unfortunately, at this point, anticipate we're going to get into a full-blown economic recovery package until the next Congress. But when we do, we saw a lot of progress this year on um, climate proposals introduced in Congress or in presidential campaigns that I think could set a marker for the types of measures we might see on energy and climate legislation next year. So next slide. I just want to wrap up by saying if these issues are important to you or your business, if you've participated in the survey and you are feeling these impacts, there are ways you can make your voice heard. Um, we have a sign on letter circulating to Congress supporting clean energy in an economic recovery package. And so when the slides are circulated, you'll see the link to that. We have more than 250 signatures thus far. And so we want to keep building momentum for this. And we encourage you to join our community at cebn.org and feel free to reach out to me or my colleague, Andy Barnes, for any further information. So thank you again, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Lynn. And um, thanks again for uh, CEBN's assistance with this, uh, this survey and the research project in general. Um, I'm also really looking forward to getting into some more of the policy related conversations that you raised um, in our group conversation. So thank you for floating those. Uh, you know, next, I would love to, um, to turn to Julia. Uh, as an economist, you cover all business sectors, not just clean energy. Can you give us your read of the terrain? Does it look like you know, the results that we're seeing from, from clean energy businesses, does that signal that they're getting hurt more than other sectors, about the same? Is this pretty much par for the course right now? What are you seeing out there? Thank you, Ryan. And thank you, uh, uh, Third Way, for inviting me to participate in uh, this event. Um, amazing results from both uh, surveys. And um, I, to answer your question, um, you know, I think that because the clean energy uh, industry is characterized by a lot of new businesses and a lot of smaller businesses, uh, there's a lot of vulnerability still out there. Uh, so I think more broadly, just to step back and make a few uh, points about where we are in the recovery and what we're learning from this. Um, you know, the COVID-19 recession has revealed a lot of, um, in addition to being, as you highlighted earlier, one of the deepest recessions we've had since the Great Depression, uh, and, uh, and still very much we are in the middle of this 
struggling to find footing for the recovery in the middle of negotiating fiscal packages. But we've also learned a lot of uh, structural things about the economy. The, the recession has revealed some structural weaknesses and structural challenges. Um, and climate change is really front and center amongst the structural issues where actually episodes like this provide an opportunity to rethink uh, what is possible, what is the issue and what is possible. So I'm gonna just touch on a few issues, uh, a few areas from a macro standpoint, and then we can turn to the discussion uh, and, and field some questions. So, one issue where there's a big rethink going on is fiscal. So this is how much government deficit and debt financing capacity a country has to support its economy in times of trouble or to make large infrastructure investments. Um, and there's been a traditional sometimes partisan divide over federal deficits. But the rethink that we are engaged in is uh, reflecting that interest rates have declined globally over the last 10 years, and they look like they're going to be low for the foreseeable future. Um, and that allows this rethink to happen, uh, this rethink of, of fiscal space. Um, what is available and what the bottom line is, we have more space available than we previously thought, and certainly the COVID-19 relief packages that have been provided provide a real-time illustration of that. So that allows us to think maybe perhaps more broadly and, and in a bigger scale uh, about tackling things like climate change um, through uh, the public sector. Now, turning to the public sector, uh, you know, the, the US has a sort of unique tension with regard to public goods and services relative to other advanced economies. Uh, and public goods and services are where the government gets involved either directly or indirectly when the profit motive in the private sector aren't delivering socially optimal outcomes. So, of course, the pandemic reveals some of the shortcomings of the U.S. bias against public goods provision uh, with regard to health care, health insurance, our approach to public health. Um, but we can also look to, you know, what we can look to our own history, we can look to examples, current examples and experiences around the world for illustrations where stronger public leadership and partnership uh, can deliver better outcomes, not just for people, uh, but for also for growth opportunities and business prospects. Uh, so from our history, we can point to the Intercontinental Railroad, Interstate Highway System, the Internet, and currently around the world, we can look to more effective public health responses facilitating faster recoveries in other advanced economies. So I think climate change is certainly an area where there's scope for strong public leadership, not to do uh, all the delivery, but to partner with the private sector in achieving the socially desirable outcomes. Um, and then finally, you know, financial markets and the role of monetary policy are absolutely essential here. We, we rely in capitalist economies on markets to assess and price risk, to allocate capital, and markets don't always process risks like climate change efficiently because the risks can be difficult to quantify for particular businesses and the timing and the impact of any, uh, uh, it, the timing of the impact is uncertain. But we are moving forward here. Ratings agencies and insurance companies are increasingly focused on, uh, on these issues. Uh, and there are efforts to create systematic carbon and climate related financial disclosure standards. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then the central bank can get involved in a number of powerful ways. So uh, Federal Reserve Governor Lael Brainerd gave a speech on this in November uh, before the COVID-19 recession and other central banks are getting very involved and very active. So first, um, the Fed and other central banks are focusing on how to incorporate climate change into its supervision of the banking system in terms of evaluating the risk profile of banks uh, and supervising uh, how that impacts the bank's uh, risk profile. Um, the Fed can also incorporate climate change into its Community Reinvestment Act standards and evaluation since we know that climate change disproportionately affects moderate and low-income communities. 
Um, but finally, the Fed can incorporate a green strategy in its, in its approach to monetary policy and supporting the economy. Uh, so with interest rates close to zero, the Fed and other central banks have increasingly used bond buying to support the economy. Um, and in the US, the Fed buys treasury and mortgage bonds and in the current cycle has engaged in more direct lending to private businesses uh, and through lending or the purchase of corporate bonds. Um, the ECB, the European Central Bank, is currently reviewing how it can address climate change through its corporate bond buying program. So they have a formal re review underway to see how they can structure their corporate bond buying program to support uh, cl uh, climate change goals. There certainly is scope to do this in the U.S. as well. And the Fed is already playing a role in financing green bonds issued by the government mortgage agencies through their mortgage purchases. So that's an example of where the Fed can actually have a very powerful impact in contributing to desired outcomes. So I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Julia. You know that, so that brings up a question for me. You're talking about some of these steps that the Fed can take, some of the steps that the Fed has taken, whether it's green bonds or other uh, financial and monetary policy steps. Are these things that can happen really quickly? Not just like, can they get implemented really quickly? And can they have results really quickly? Because as Lynn was saying, you know, we are seeing these businesses that are really dying on the vine, but we don't anticipate that Congress is necessarily going to be able to do something to help within the next few months. How quickly can some of those, those steps that you're describing be taken? Well, they're already sort of passively happening quickly. So the, the advantage of monetary policy generally is that the Fed has the freedom to act quickly rather than going through a sticky fiscal negotiation. And so already the Fed is buying green bonds that are issued by the mortgage agencies. And so is contributing. Now that wasn't a stated goal uh, to achieve the, the support of the green uh, industry, but it is uh, sort of a side effect of its aggressive monetary support that it's been engaged in. Similarly, I would say in the Main Street lending facility that it is uh, lend lending to mid medium-sized businesses through the banking sector, certainly that's available right now to, um, to green firms and to green energy companies, um, as well as to anybody else. Uh, and so um, that and its corporate bond buying program too is available to the green energy industry. Um, it's not a specific target as of yet. And I would say probably requires more of a sort of review and a strategic focus that will take some time to tilt those kinds of programs in a more directed fashion to, to, uh, climb, to achieve climate goals, but it's sort of de facto indirectly doing it now. Okay. That makes sense. Um, thank you very much. And Ellen, I'd like to turn to you now. Um, so you're a co-author of this research. I was wondering if you could first just talk to us a little bit about how this survey that Third Way did differs from some of the other data that's being gathered on the pandemic's impact on clean energy businesses. And I also, it's a two-parter, would, um, I'd love for you to, to tell us you know, what you found most striking or, or possibly even surprising about the responses that we got from this survey. Great, thank, thank you, Ryan. And wonderful discussion that you kicked off here and really appreciate the opportunity to speak with everybody out in the audience about uh, this survey. I wanna first uh, mention that Last year, there were over 3 million clean energy jobs in the U.S. economy. Lynn highlighted that on one of her slides. And we know from BW Research Partnership with E2 that their measurement has shown that there have been about 600,000 job losses in the February to April COVID period of the onset of this very severe crisis and recession, and that we have now seen about 100,000 of those jobs come back since April, and that would be including some of their estimates for July. Why we decided to do this survey 
was to get a very good sense from a qualitative standpoint how many different types of clean energy companies are coping during this severe recession. And it's quite interesting that, you know, we designed the survey to reach out to all different kinds of clean energy companies. And that really distinguishes some of our results from other uh, approaches. I want to kind of just for a minute bring this back to some of the issues that we grappled with at the Department of Commerce when I was chief economist there during the Obama administration. Because uh, our secretary, Penny Pritzker, really worked diligently to open up data assets so that if we measure what's happening in the economy and to businesses, we're better able to innovate, we're better able to invest and to grow new technologies. And one of the areas I think our survey results clearly show is that there is significant activity in the clean energy economy and businesses are really trying to um, move ahead and grow decisively, not just now, but coming out of this COVID recession and into the long term. To turn to the other, I guess the other part of your question, Ryan, is what really shocked me here. I've got to tell you, I was absolutely blown away at the insights that were provided with the open-ended question we had about what these businesses were thinking in terms of climate change and policies that would help them not just survive the COVID recession, but thrive in the future. We had so many emphasize competitiveness, US-based manufacturing, how policies could help nudge investment in the right direction so that we can address the risks associated with climate change. Absolutely um, just incredible emphasis on investment, innovation, clean energy technologies. These people aren't looking for a handout. This is all about how do we get to sustainability? How do we address climate change so that it isn't the next shock to bring down our economy and in the process hurt our American workers? So I guess I'll leave it there and we can um, address other parts of the survey. Sure, great. Um, well, I think um, you know, one, one thing that stood out to me Here's something that didn't stand out to me in some of the policy section of the survey. Seeing tax related policies at the top of the priority list. So we had new tax credits um, and we also had that monetization, that direct pay or, or cash grant um, conversion of existing tax credits. And that's something that we have seen from a lot of uh, industry associations and wind, solar, carbon capture, et cetera. And it's really picked up during the pandemic because um, you know where they're seeing huge challenges in trying to keep some of these projects afloat. So that made sense. One thing that um, that I did see was interesting was that the number three choice was um, increasing public investment in infrastructure. Um, over a quarter of the respondents selected that as a priority. And I think you know, when, I, when I think about infrastructure investments, they are extremely important, but I do tend to think of them as being things that are larger and maybe um, providing more medium and, and long-term benefit, um, not something that would be able to assist in a month or two. Um, do any of you have any uh, thoughts, opinions, you know, disagree with kind of the, the assumption that I've got um, about the, why infrastructure would be a top policy for businesses that are struggling? Yeah, I'd love to chime in on that, Ryan. Um, I think we have to remember that infrastructure is a very diverse and all-encompassing term. And infrastructure can mean giant, you know, transportation highway projects that take a few decades to build. It can be massive solar farms that take, you know, a good number of years to build. Or it can be, um, you know, a community solar installation, retrofitting, 
commercial HVAC systems to be, um, you know, more efficient and also better filter out particles. And so I think that a lot of the the types of federal and state infrastructure spending that we've seen, you know, there are some longer term projects, um, but frankly, even those put people to work right away. And I have noticed, you know, when I'm jogging around my neighborhood, there doesn't seem to be a slowdown in certain kinds of infrastructure, such as people, you know, uh, tending to parklands or repairing the roads. Um, so I think maybe what you're seeing reflected in that response from businesses is that they would like to see more of these kind of public private partnerships that Julia mentioned that can put people to work. Um, and I think, frankly, some of that can be done right now in safe, socially distant manners, if only we had, you know, I think what you're seeing with the, the tax, the tax issues and the infrastructure being at the top of the list to me speaks of the need for project finance. People are ready to work and build these projects that will help rebuild a cleaner and more resilient future. Um, but right now they're struggling because there's a lack of capital available at the state and local level. Those governments are struggling and then there's a lack of capital available from customers. So if we can find ways to leverage federal resources to unlock some of the state and local capital in efficient ways, and I think Julia, Julia has the, you know, can tell you much better than I can what that looks like, um, people are willing to, to work on those projects. Yeah, yeah, Ryan, I'd like to add to that, to what Lynn uh, saying, you know, completely agree with all the points she's, she's making. And I think from a sort of near term cyclical standpoint, what a big infrastructure investment package could do is provide the scale and the financing uh, and the demand, you know, the revenue streams uh, that are missing and, are, and that are harder to come by in a recession. So from a cyclical standpoint, even though we're talking about very long-term projects, it does provide the near-term boost that's missing. We are missing the dollars flowing in the economy right now. The, the government can uh, provide that and help jumpstart things that can then become more self-sustaining over time. And then just adding to, you know, sort of a point from a, a, an economist's perspective, there are complementarities uh, between public and private investment um, with regard to clean energy. So let's think about electric vehicles. If the government steps in and invests in a charging infrastructure, well, that can help shift private demand by consumers towards the electric vehicle industry and achieve desired outcomes. So there's, there's a complementarity to both the public investment and what will lead to more private sector demand and investment uh, in a clean energy industry. I want to uh, just dovetail a little bit on that. My experience in the auto industry is exactly that, Julia, that we have seen, you know, a lot of the competitive costs really get come down. I think, Lynn, you mentioned uh, that costs are now getting very economic, which means that transferring and transforming to electric vehicles makes a lot of sense now because the battery cost has come down so much. If you can just make that investment in the charging infrastructure, and if you can just nudge a little bit to help with the capital cost of retooling factories and helping to ensure that your excellent workforce begins to be trained to produce those new electric vehicles. Well, you know, you're there. So we're very close on a number of fronts. Electric vehicles, I think, is one example. Well, thank you. That actually, that very succinctly cleared up my, <laughs> my question about why we would see that. Uh, and that all of those, all of those answers make a lot of sense. And it does seem like there is a, there is a mix. There isn't a single policy that that clean energy businesses across this industry are saying, we need this and this will save us. It seems quite obvious that not just between the distinctions of, of a you know, wind producer um, or a, you know, a, a, um, a solar panel manufacturer or somebody that's making some type of uh, a smart grid component, there are those distinctions, but there's also a distinction of people in these, industry, in these industries are looking at near term and urgent needs, but also how do I, how do I have or instill the uh, long-term confidence in lenders 
to actually make larger investments now that will help us grow and, ben and benefit the industry for years. So um, thank you for clearing that up for me. Um, you know, still on the policy vein here, but maybe taking a slightly different tack. Another thing that struck me from our results of the survey was the percentage of respondents who took advantage of PPP, Paycheck Protection Program. And we know this is a relatively small sample size, but these clean energy businesses, they were taking advantage of PPP at three times the national average for all businesses. Um, so, you know, I'd, I'd love, you know, if, if folks have any thoughts first on, on that and what we might be seeing there and whether that, you know, could just be a, a blip. Um, uh, I'd love for thoughts on that. But, you know, I'd also like to, um, to turn the conversation from that point into the startling results we saw about what some of these clean energy businesses are preparing to have to do when supports like PPP dry up. So I guess first I would open it up and say, any thoughts on why we might be seeing, um, you know, a, an increased usage of PPP among these respondents, but also what does this look like when, when PPP dries up? What does that actually mean for a business? Uh, and is there something that can be extended using existing authority or the current program um, that can provide additional lifeline to these businesses. Well, Ryan, I, I would say that, you know, the disproportionate take up of PPP reflects, you know, something I touched on earlier, which is that a lot of the clean energy industry is characterized by young uh, businesses and smaller businesses that are eligible for the program since it was specifically targeted at companies with less than 500 employees. Um, so I think that, you know, the, the PPP and a lot of the fiscal, that big first fiscal round of, of support was pretty well designed in terms of getting money quickly to companies and providing a lifeline. But I think what you're highlighting is that we're reaching kind of a, a critical inflection point where on the one hand, the macro data has been okay on balance. We are seeing signs of a recovery taking hold, but how sustainable is that? Have we reached that self-sustaining phase or do we need another round of support? Um, I'm definitely tilted towards the latter. I think why err on the side of, of um, caution right now in terms of the fiscal space issues, we've got low rates. We've got, you know, healthy demand for government bonds. Uh, so why not err on the side of more support and making sure that these young industries don't die on the vine when they're the industries that we're looking to achieve really critical um, goal, longer term goals. So mm -hmm. I think you're touching on a vulnerability that's very real time uh, and we need to see a better, a stronger sense of urgency in Washington. Thank you. And I would just add, I, I suspect that um, even though you're seeing a very high utilization of PPP with clean energy businesses, I actually, um, I would think that's an underestimate compared to the demand for that because there are some companies, um, and this is, we saw this was actually an issue in particular for equity owned startup companies. Uh, there are some restrictions on their ability to access the PPP if they're owned by a if, if they have majority equity ownership by um, a larger, you know, corporation that wouldn't qualify. Um, and their treasury did provide some clarification of that. Um, but I will say, you know, those corporations aren't bailing out those small businesses. I've, in some cases they will, but in a lot of cases they won't. So I think there is probably even higher demand than we, you know, in companies that weren't able to use it. Um, and I would just, you know, to, to follow up on Julia's point about the additional, the need to continue to sustain these businesses through this period of uncertainty is critical. And I think that's critical for small businesses of all um, types, not just clean energy. But one of the things that I do find a little bit frustrating, and I, and I, I understand um, and think it's correct that Congress has focused on the immediate crisis and the immediate need for relief. But this is looking to be a fairly sustained pandemic. I mean, we're likely not going to be seeing people returning to normal operations until well into next year in terms of, you know, 
removing the need for physical distancing and, and things of that nature. Even after we have a vaccine, it's going to be prioritized for, um, you know, frontline workers. And so we need to start thinking about how are we, are, are, can we use the federal investments we are making in, in keeping the economy afloat? Can we use those investments more wisely? And, and I do think it's important that we continue to provide PPP, Main Street lending, and other types of relief um, for those who have been put out of work, and necessarily so because of the health crisis. But again, delaying action on economic recovery is just kicking the can down the road. And, and as I pointed out earlier, instead of paying clean energy companies to pay their employees to sit at home, some of those businesses could be safely working on infrastructure projects. There are empty commercial buildings out there that need their HVAC systems retrofit. There are rooftops that solar could be put on. There, these are, there are public works projects. Just like I see the people replacing, you know, the sod and um, pruning trees outdoors in my neighborhood, people could be working. And so I think, um, I really hope that Congress starts to think, and I know many, many members and many committees are working hard on this. Um, and it's just a matter of, can we find the political will and the compromise to move something forward so we can start investing in infrastructure that will actually help our economy and our planet in the longer term. Thank you. Um, absolutely. I just wanted to add to that, you know, that that is, you know, the, the whole idea of the expanded unemployment benefits um, was to support workers when we wanted them to stay home, when we wanted them to uh, shelter in place and not, you know, and, and still be able to feed their families and pay the rent. And that was an extremely well-designed pr program. Now that we know, as Lynn highlighted, that this is going to be kind of a medium-term issue, um, we can start retooling that approach towards something that is directed towards public investment and achieves uh, more employment opportunities um, as a way of addressing that 10% unemployment rate that we still have, which is still higher than anything we saw in the Great Recession. This is, but we are not through this by a long shot. So why not direct that fiscal support to something that will create value in the, for the longer run? Yeah, and you know, we also saw in the survey uh, when John presented the one slide about, well, what's gonna happen in the next three months? And a lot of these businesses are going to have to cut their workforces or hours or, uh, you know, take wage cut um, actions. And that's exactly what we want to prevent. The, these workers are ready to go. We can do it safely if we know how to use PPP, uh, PPE effectively. There are programs that can be put in place to make sure that we can get to uh, more sustainable growth over time. And I think that's one of the things that the leaders that responded to the survey mentioned quite frequently. Yeah, thank you. I, quick note uh, aside, I wanna make sure everyone listening knows you can use the Q&A feature up down at the bottom. A few of you have already put in some questions that we'll have a chance to, um, to read to our, um, our panelists. But if you have others, please start adding them now. We've got about 10 minutes left. So now would be the time to start putting those in. Um, and we can actually get to, uh, to one of those. Um, uh, Alareza had asked um, uh, earlier during John's presentation why nuclear power was not included. Um, uh, though nuclear energy is a major uh, producer of carbon-free power. Um, and that is a really great point. Um, and so I can answer this one. Actually, this was not a, a deliberate um, action. They were not uh, deliberately excluded. Um, we use a lot of different channels to try and get respondents um, who self-identify as clean energy. But I think we did also recognize that we're going to have to do a little bit more to try to, we have great diversity of, uh, of sectors within the industry, but we might have to try to, to um, actively seek out some of them a little bit more and make sure we're getting those responses. So when we do our follow-up survey, that's something that we intend to do. Um, another question that came in, and I think maybe this one could be for Lynn, 
Um, this one is about customer education, and I'll, I'll paraphrase, but you had mentioned customer education um, and, and uh, getting communities and stakeholders engaged in decisions about supporting low carbon energy. Uh, this uh, participant wanted to know, how are industries and policymakers addressing complex issues uh, that define socially desirable outcomes That's and great, pot potential yeah. social barriers for the growth of the technologies? That's a great question. And it's something we've actually thought about quite a lot since um, in our initial, uh, we, about, I'd say in 2017, we did some um, intense surveys of our members and this theme of customer education came up and we thought a lot about, well, what's the policy solution to that? You know, what does that mean? Um, and I, I, I'm going to use an example of a program that I think is an effective way to work with stakeholders to um, build the, uh, layers of understanding and, and support for new forms of, of technology. So um, there's a new program that we, we in our parent organization and many of our partners are very active in pushing for the creation of, and it's called, um, it's at FEMA, and it's called the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program. And it's finally just launched this year and um, has many layers of uh, financial assistance, but also kind of technical assistance to work with communities across the nation to help them um, proactively develop more resilient infrastructure that can better withstand natural disasters and other forms of stressors. Um, and energy is part of the mix. And so it's kind of a combination of um, policy, you know, grants money that comes with policy directives in sort of the idea of you're gonna build better, you're gonna build stronger. Um, but there's also an education component to that. So I do think that um, there is a role for uh, government to help provide those kinds of policy signals that help promote greater um, awareness and, and adoption of stronger or cleaner or, you know, other kind of socially beneficial forms of infrastructure. And that can cu cu be coupled with, um, when you couple the financial support with the stakeholder engagement and education, it's a very successful model. Mm. Any other thoughts on that? We have a couple other questions we can get to also. Um, uh, yes, I can let uh, a few folks have asked whether or not some of these results will be available. We will be making the results available, including the full list of questions that we asked. Um, and there was also a question about um, how much is employment being hit due to corporate and state or local government cutbacks versus actions being taken by homeowners and individuals. Um, you know, we didn't necessarily look into that in our survey, but if any of our panelists have thoughts or other insights on that, uh, please jump in. So we've definitely seen both. Um, the state and local sector has already laid off more workers than we've ever seen in any prior recession because the hit to their revenue streams. Well, first, the first hit uh, to, st to government employment came from the, the shutdown. Uh, so, you know, school bus drivers and custodians and so on lost their jobs uh, early in April and May. Um, but now we're seeing the fiscal uh, situation really come to bear on, you know, sort of medium term budget planning. So state and local government layoffs are coming and they're going to probably accelerate, particularly as it doesn't seem like there's the will right now in DC to provide direct assistance to state and local governments to prevent that. So I think that's coming in, there will be a wave of that in the fall. Um, and then we see just amongst cutbacks by different sectors and, and households, uh, just a real mix of, of um, outcomes that reflect the virus. You know, we see um, the housing industry actually doing pretty well because you can do construction in a safe, socially distanced way, number one, and number two, people are sort of hunkering down and spending more money on housing and so on, whereas anything that's tied to social engagement, entertainment, restaurants, um, uh, these types of, you know, sporting uh, education, obviously getting tremendously hit. So it's, it's a very broad base, both public and private, uh, in terms of cutbacks in employment. It has a specific pattern that is tied to the, the virus and, and social distancing. 
yeah, I think Ju Julia put that really well. And the only thing I would add is, um, you know, I do think what you're, what, to her point that it's, it's a combination of all of these factors just reflects the types of customers that we see in the clean energy industry. And those range from residential customers, commercial scale developments to um, municipal and governments. And, and, and all of these have been hit. Um, I did see also in that question in the chat box that the, um, person who posed it asked if any sectors have been particularly hard hit. And um, one thing we have seen and heard from a lot of members, it, really everyone has been hard hit, but um, I do think that the residential energy efficiency industry has, we saw at least in the, um, some of the, the initial data that came out of BW, BW research um, earlier in the spring was particularly quickly and significantly hard hit because people didn't want contractors coming in their homes. And there have been some policy proposals such as a bill called Hope, Hope for Homes, which would provide some assistance um, to, uh, you know, both in the forms of financial assistance to homeowners to help them, but also um, some, some uh, training programs and, and to get people back to work in that industry as it becomes safe to do so. Thank you. Yeah, um, we did see a pretty, um, a pretty widespread of um, responses in terms of how these industries have been coping and what uh, steps they've taken in terms of furloughs, reduced work hours. Um, and so we have some cross tabs on that and that might be worth uh, us putting out in a separate, uh, separate note just to show, you know, it, it wasn't drastic in most cases. Um, but uh, it is something that we are trying to keep an eye on, especially for um, for our follow-on survey to see if those if there are changes within those sectors of the industries. Um, we've got just a couple of minutes left. So um, let me see if we can, uh, can get to just one more question. Um, uh, there's a question about the subset of clean energy jobs that can be done remotely, supply chain, monitoring, management, um, and, and the ones that fit into the new sustainable practices model. Are there any that we haven't referenced already that folks want to, to um, offer as examples? Yeah, you know, I, that's a really good question because, you know, uh, if you take the wind industry, for example, there are a lot of data scientists that are working remotely to manage our wind turbine farms and our offshore wind facilities. And therefore, there are certain types of jobs in clean energy that can be done very well remotely and are really substantial growth uh, sectors in clean energy uh, over time. And the other sector that we're starting to see as well that, that handles that remote and also uh, with some PPE uh, protections are manufacturing, manufacturing of wind turbines, manufacturing of electric vehicles, and manufacturing of charging infrastructure, charging station infrastructure. So there are lots of different types of jobs in clean energy that can continue to grow uh, with proper funding. Excellent, thank you. Well, so that uh, we're at the end of our hour, um, and I wanna thank everybody who attended um, in a, uh, a summer week in August. Um, I want to pay uh, special thanks to Julia and to Ellen and Lynn, as well as John Milko for, um, for being with us today and presenting this information. Like I said, we're going to be sending the link to the full memo um, to everyone who signed up for this uh, webinar. And we'll also be informing you about our future rounds of, uh, of surveys going out to the clean energy business community. So please stay tuned for that. And again, Thank you very much um, and please enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.